Well, good morning. Holy greetings to you, brothers and sisters, and God bless you. This is Scott Bradley, and this is the Rivers of Life Inspirational Broadcast. We pray for you to have tuned us into this day, a day that the Lord has made, and we are rejoicing and glad in it. As we say to you every week, it's reason to rejoice. This is a festive season, a holiday season. But of course, those of us that know the Lord Jesus Christ, we know that every day is a day of thanksgiving, a day of celebration, a day of celebrating the Savior, Him coming into the world, dying and saving us from our sins. Brother Lionel Harris is singing that song, Touch Me, Lord, and even though we do not own the rights to the music, we are praying, touch us, Lord. We want the Lord to touch us one more time with His goodness, His grace, His mercy, and His Spirit. God bless you. Thank God. Come on in. Come on into the room. We've got a word for you. Come on in. We've got something to share with you. Come on in and hear a word from the Lord. I want you to encourage you to hit the share button. Every one of you uh, that are viewing this, please hit the share button. Let other people know that we're on. And then, of course, as we always ask, please let us know where you are viewing from, whether you're viewing us near or far, whether you're viewing us in these United States or other parts of the world. As this broadcast weekly goes out to all parts of the world. And we thank the Lord for what he is doing and what he's continuing to do in our lives. So let's pray. Touch me, Lord, with your power and with your spirit. Thank you, Brother Larnell. God bless your heart, sir. Amen. We thank God for him and uh, for you that are tuning us in today. Let's glorify and magnify the name of the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we are rejoicing and glad in it. Amen. All right. God bless. We, 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 this, of course, being the Christmas season, and I've got a word today that I want to deal with that, that we might understand the true meaning of it. Of course, uh, we go over it every year. Christmas has become commercialized. Uh, merchants are making money off of it. Uh, and the true spirit of it has been lost, look like down through the years. Uh, we're going to visit that in a second. That's going to be our, our, what we're going to share with you today. But I want to take the opportunity to make this statement, brothers and sisters. It, it, I've, I've been listening to people, uh, particularly on uh, religious broadcasting, uh, some things that people are saying. And I want to address you just a few seconds. Uh, people say that certain gifts have ceased, that we're no longer in the age of miracles, that uh, we are, uh, people have resisted. Uh, the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues uh, or what's referred to as glossolalia. People are resisting that and saying that's not for this time. That was for the early church. Well, I beg to dip with you. And I think uh, we have to understand that in many cases, because things seemingly did not happen and in, in many cases didn't happen for thousands of years, is not that it did not happen altogether. Uh, it happened such as miracles such as glossolalia, the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues, did happen, but it happened in smaller circles and usually amongst remote people. The reason I say that is because where people don't believe, the manifestation of God is not going to happen. If you don't believe in miracles, you'll never be the recipient of one. If you don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the Lord is not going to force anything upon you. Even in Jesus' day, the Bible said that when he was in Capernaum, he could not do any miracles or mighty works because the people did not believe. And we will find that as we move through history from the, from the first century of the early church 2,000 years ago up until the present time, there was a long period of time where it looked like those things ceased to operate, such as the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues, such as miracles. Well, they did not operate widespread. They did not operate widespread. But in my own study, I found there were certain groups uh, that maintain that. And I'm not talking about cults. I'm not talking about folk that play with snakes and all that kind of fool nonsense. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about uh, in certain areas of the world, it's among certain ones, that held on to the scriptures and believed the scriptures, uh, the manifestation of God began to work in their uh, settings. Uh, and again, it wasn't as widespread because in that period of history, we went through a lot of things uh, that, that almost uh, seemingly... Uh, the, well, the church went in a different direction. Let me put it to that way. It, it began to embrace Catholicism and, and, and some of the other false teachings uh, that, that took them away. But there were those that held on to the real gospel and the true salvation and experienced the things, uh, these things. In, in the 20th century, of course, we had a great outpour where it became widespread because it was a fulfilling of the prophecy when the Lord said, In the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And things like the Azusa Street Revival and other various things that began to break out in the United States in 1906 in, in uh, Los Angeles there uh, and, and began to spread across the country and throughout the world. 
we had a widespread outpour of a manifestation of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking tongues. Miracles begin to take place as they do now. Miracle ministries begin to emerge. So a lot of things begin to happen in the 20th century and even in the 21st century. Uh, another thing I think we should take note of is that it not just stay with ex exclusively within the Pentecostal movement, what we refer to as the Pentecostal movement. Uh, when at one time it was mocked at about 100 years ago, uh, the first, the first, early part of the 20th century, uh, ninth, in the early 1900s, uh, when it was mocked by various religions and it called a delusion and other various things. Now here we are 100 years later and it's crossed all the denominational lines. You, you find people experiencing miracles in the baptism of the Holy Ghost, not just in the Pentecostal church, but in the Baptist church, in the Methodist church, uh, in the Lutheran church, uh, even in the Catholic church. Many of some have experienced uh, this type of outpour. So miracles have not ceased. There are those that are fighting now saying that doesn't happen, that's nonsense, that ceased. It has not ceased. It has not ceased. It's still evident and prevalent today. And I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, I think that you should take note that if it's happening to other people, just because it's not happening to you does not mean it's not happening. It will happen for you if you open up your heart and mind and say, Lord, let me receive everything that you have for me. You want me to experience the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You want me to experience miracles in my life. And you have to know that that's what God wants for you. The Lord is not holding you remote. The Lord is not holding you, uh, says it's for everybody but you. It can happen to you if you can believe. Now, again, I just wanted to say that before we get into the heart of the presentation today, because, again, this is the Christmas season. And uh, I've got something that I want to share with you that I believe the Lord laid upon my heart early this morning, early this morning. Uh, it came to me. Uh, St. Luke, this is very familiar, but I'm going to read it. St. Luke, the second chapter, and starting at verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding them in their field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came unto them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Now again, it's to all people. Even though it came initially to the Jews, the Bible said that he came to his own, but his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And that includes you and me, brothers and sisters. All of us that would be willing to come to Jesus, he said he would in no wise cast out. Salvation has come to all people. Uh, verse 11, and this is why I want to derive, derive my presentation from today. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. I want to deal with that. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. A Savior, a Savior. What is a Savior? Why do we need a Savior? Why is it necessary that a Savior came? Uh, you've heard me say this, brothers and sisters, and I'll repeat, of course, when I say it again here today, and that is that there is a difference between religion and personal relationship. If religion could have saved mankind, it never would have been necessary for Jesus to come because the world has always had religion, even from the very beginning. The first murder that took place took place over a difference of religious practice, Cain murdered his own flesh and blood Abel over a difference of religious practice. The world has always had religion. In fact, I remember when I was in uh, college, and, and I can't think what particular class this was, uh, but they told us that there's never been a atheist, atheistic culture since the beginning of time. As far back as they can go and study, there's always been a religious culture or religion within the culture. Now, somebody said, what about communism? Communism was not a culture. Communism was a government, but even within communism, there are still those that practice religion. Uh, sometimes they are persecuted for it. Sometimes they're jailed for it. A number of things happen, but you cannot stop man's knowledge of knowing that there is God because it's in man to know there is God. How did man come to this conclusion? Well, I was talking with a brother from Africa not too long ago, and he said he knows it because it's in him. Because when God breathed into man the breath of life, he breathed himself into man. Uh, the Bible says in the book of uh, Genesis, I believe it's 2 and 8, and God breathed, the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That's 2 and 7. And man became a living soul. Well, how did man know there was God? 
because God breathed himself into man. And man has always known since his existence that there is God. He may have called him different things. He may not have come to the knowledge, but he's always had a, a religion or desire to please or to serve or to seek God. Now, if that alone could have saved a man, it never would have been necessary for Jesus to come. And you have to understand the devil. The Bible says that the devil goeth about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he, he may devour. And the devil knows if man searches for God unimpeded, uh, he would find God. So he's created religions. He's created, and, and here's what I tell you, the devil has created many religions. Uh, the devil has created religions. The devil has created, created uh, 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 all of the different things that go with it, uh, styles and mannerisms, uh, which oftentimes include bizarre things like sacrificing, human sacrifice, and, and uh, oh, my God, all different kind of things that, that go along with you. And you know what religions do down through the years. But I've oftentimes said this, that religion without relationship makes all religions, including Christianity, it makes them in vain. What do you mean by that, brother preacher? Why would you say even Christianity? Well, again, religious duty. There's religious duty. There's religious action. People do things out of religious conscience. They do things out of religious conviction. But they don't know Jesus. Because knowing Jesus is deeper and greater and more intimate than religion. Amen. Now, uh, and you've heard me use this illustration before. And incidentally, my wife and I use this illustration about marriage because... Those of you that don't know, my wife and I this past week just celebrated 40 years of marriage. I've been married to one woman for 40 years. Thank the Lord. Yes, I praise the Lord for that. And I'm kind of proud of it. I mean, we've been together. And again, we didn't we weren't together until we got married. You understand? We didn't live together until we got married. Praise the Lord. We didn't fornicate until we got married. Then within marriage, it was legal and holy. Amen. Make that clear. Uh, but my point is this, that in marriage... You have the institution of marriage, but then you have the intimacy within marriage, you know, uh, and that's what religion is. Religion is simply the institution. But if you don't know Jesus, you don't have the intimacy or the relationship or the communication or the love. You don't have that if you don't know Jesus. All you have is the institution. Now, again, my wife and I can very easily say we've been married for 40 years. But if we have not had the intimacy and then the relationship and the lovemaking and the friendship even and all those other things that go within a marriage, you really have nothing at all except the institution. Religion, brothers and sisters, is the institution. But knowing Jesus is the intimacy. Praise the Lord. And if we are lacking the intimacy... By not knowing Jesus, it makes our religion in vain. The word Savior means a person who saves someone from danger. One who brings salvation. Now notice the salutation of the angel to these shepherds. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. A Savior. Not another religious figure. Not another religious figure. Not something else to, to uh, uh, you know go about and try to keep the rules because again the beautiful thing about our walk with god when we establish a relationship is that he now becomes the savior from the consequence of our sin practicing religion only tries to make us become good enough and really that's what it boils down to because people still have the myth even now millenniums later still have the myth that going to heaven is being a good person if i'm a good person i go to heaven bad people go to hell well that's i'm afraid that's not true i'm afraid that's a myth uh, you can be a very good person, a lot of times good in the eyes of people. How many times have we uh, lost people that were good people, good men, good women, helped the community? Oh, my God, bought toys for children on Christmas time. Uh, uh, well, we're very nice and pleasant people. Well, that does not qualify you, brothers and sisters, to go to heaven. Because all of us, the Bible says, all have sin. Sin separates us from God. Which is why the Lord sent his son to die for every one of us that are sinners. And so it's up to us to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Not trying to be good because we're never good enough. And I want you to get that. We're never good enough. We're never good enough to go to heaven. We just, good people don't go to heaven. A lot of good people, unfortunately, because they don't know Jesus, are going to still go to hell. That's a sad thing to say, but I'm afraid it's true. And uh, we have to remember and understand that it's only through Jesus our salvation. The word salvation means preservation or deliverance from harm. 
So Christ has become our salvation. He's become our deliverance. He's become our help. He's become our preservation from harm or the consequence of sin. All have sinned. All have sinned, the Bible said. All have sinned. Everyone, all good people have sinned. All nice people have sinned. Your mother and your father have sinned. You and me have sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But here is, is the love of God. And you know, people uh, oftentimes will say, uh, you know, well, why would God, if God was such a loving God, why would he send us to hell? First of all, God is not going to send you to hell. You choose hell when you reject Christ. There is no other name given unto man. Matter of fact, I got it down. Let me quote it. Uh, uh, this is Acts 4 and 12 when Paul said, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. Salvation is only in Jesus. Salvation is only in Jesus. Now, again, this is the Christmas season, and I want to bring this out because I don't want to, you know, uh, bust your bubble, brothers and sisters. Then again, maybe I am because I want you to understand that it's not about the, the babe and swaddling clothes and laying in the manger and, and all of the uh, people came and the wise men came. And incidentally, the wise men didn't come at this moment. It was years later before the wise men came to see Jesus. Uh, Jesus was already a toddler by the time they came and presented those gifts. But we look at these nativity scenes and we see shepherds and we see wise men and we see uh, they even got a little drummer boy. That, that's not in nowhere in the Bible, but someone came up with a drummer boy playing a drum, uh, all that kind of thing. You know, and none of that stuff is scriptural. None of that stuff is accurate. It's not accurate. Uh, but my point is this. We preach about that. We talk about that. And we get glad because Jesus was born, the baby, the Savior. But see, he's no longer a baby. He's a grown man. He was all man and all God, and he's grown man and full God, seated at the right hand of the Father. He's no longer laying there wiggling and goo-goo and gaga and all that kind of stuff. He's now passing judgment but he came now going back to my point if god so loved us why would he send us to hell we, he does not send us to hell we go to hell on our own because of a choice that we make are you going to accept jesus as your lord and savior or are you going to reject him there is salvation in no other name the scripture says no other name other than the name of jesus or yeshua if you prefer that's the uh, Hebrew name of Jesus. Jesus is the Greek name. Yahshua, the Hebrew name, which actually what we pronounce is Joshua. Uh, but it's the same thing. But there's salvation in none other, other than Jesus. If I can use this illustration, brothers and sisters, it's just like a person in a pool drowning. You know, when I was eight years old, I almost drowned. Uh, I've had that experience of almost drowning. <laughs> Look back on it now. And, you know, I, I, as a matter of fact, I'll tell you, I, I remember it quite well. Of course, something that traumatic even though I was eight years old, it's hard to forget. I remember thinking I was going to die. I remember thinking while I was in that pool sucking water, this is it, you know. Uh, but it, uh, I floated out far enough, far enough to be able to grab onto a, uh, there was a, a platform in the middle of the pool. Now, I got that far out. It's a long story. But I was actually following my cousin. He could swim. I couldn't, but I figured I'd do what he did. And uh, he swam and I sank. Uh, but I drifted out far enough, kicking and flapping all the way, and grabbed onto the platform in the center of the pool and was able to hold on. The platform was stable. The platform was not uh, going to go under. And so that was my salvation, as it were. Uh, then I had another fellow who could swim, took me back to the uh, shallow end. Uh, again, it's a long story. But my point is this. A drown drowning person cannot save another drowning person. There's no way while I was out there drowning that I could have saved anybody else because I was a victim of the same pool, the same water, the same body that was taking me under and about to kill me was a, was killing, could have killed everybody else. And this is why there's salvation in no other name. There is no salvation in Mohammed, my brothers and sisters. There is no salvation in Buddha. These men cannot save you because they are sinners just like you. A sinner cannot save a sinner. Trying to be good is not going to save you. Following the commandments is not going to save you. Because the reality is, all of us have violated the law. You know, the law that God established with Moses uh, was not for our salvation. It was to point man to his failures because nobody could keep the law. 
And that's why it was necessary to make sacrifices, offer lambs and, and uh, turtle doves and, and all those different types of sacrifices that were made for the blood to be shed, the blood of the innocent to be shed for the guilty. All of us are guilty. God loved us so much until he didn't want to see all of us just perish and go to hell. So he sent his son. The Bible said in John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So Christ was there in creation with God. He was there in the beginning with God. He was the salvation of mankind. And he thought it not uh, wrong to humble himself, to take the form of a servant. Now, he was God, but took the form of a servant, became a man, lived perfect according to his own law. Nobody could live that law but him. He was perfect to the law. And therefore, he died as an innocent man for all of us that are guilty. He is the Savior. He is the one that can save us from the consequence of our sin. The wages of sin is death. But the Bible said, the gift of God, and this of course being the Christmas season where we're celebrating the giving and receiving of the gifts, the greatest gift is the gift of God, which is eternal life through, not Mohammed, not Buddha, not Confucius, but through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So he is our salvation. He is our savior. He is our redeemer. He is our deliverance. Praise the Lord. Jesus was all man and all God, as I stated before. And what we mean by that is that as a man, he felt all of the pain and the passion and the suffering. Jesus suffered on the cross. He didn't just remove himself and say, well, the body is suffering, but I'm removing myself. No, no. He suffered. And everything that he suffered, we deserve. All of the pain, he felt the pain of the, 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 the scourging, the beating of the, the cat of nine tails all across his back. He felt that. He felt the pain and the agony of the crown of thorns upon his head. He felt when they smote him and punched him and hit him and spit upon him. He felt all of that. He felt the pain and the agony of carrying that cross up the hill. He felt when they nailed his hands and his feet to the cross. Why did he do that? Because of his love for us. His love for us. Now, you want to turn around and reject that and say, God is not going to send me to hell. Of course not. He provided a way that you don't have to go. It's only through Jesus. A sinner cannot save a sinner, as I said before. And I'm saying again, a sinner cannot save a sinner. It's through Jesus, all man and all God, who did not have the nature of sin, who was the perfect man, who everywhere where the Bible said the first Adam failed, he being the second Adam has made all things alive. So our hope and our faith is in Jesus Christ. And it's deeper, brothers and sisters, than religion. It's deeper than just being dutiful. Now understand, if we're really going to follow Christ, I believe that we ought to follow him humbly. I believe that we ought to follow him dutifully. I believe that we ought to follow him in the ways that he would have. Uh, and, you know, the Bible even said when a man's ways please the Lord, that even his enemies can make his enemies be at peace. There's a way to following God. There's a lifestyle that we ought to live. And the Bible said if we sin. We have an advocate with the Father. But it doesn't mean, well, yeah, and particularly this doctrine, I believe it's a genuinely false doctrine that says once saved, always saved. Some of y'all feel like you can get saved and go out and live in your kind of way and do whatever, whatever and, and commit fornication and, and lie and rob and steal and whatnot. Well, I'm saved. No, you're not. You're not following the path of the Savior. You're not following the path of the Lord. You're not following the example. Apostle Paul said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid how should we that are dead to sin continue any longer therein? So there has to be a following. And you all of a time heard me say, when Jesus Christ becomes the Lord of our life, the motive of the servant is to please his Lord and to do the will of his Lord. And so there is a commitment. There is a conviction. There is an, and this comes as a result, as I said before, of the intimacy. The relationship with the Lord. Don't just sit the Lord way out in heaven, way out in the stars somewhere, way out there in the amazing mountain. No, no. He's right here with you. He wants to make us abode in you. And that's what the intimacy of knowing the Savior is all about. Hallelujah. Again, uh, notice what this, why does man need a Savior? And our time is getting away from us here. But why do you, why do I, why do every one of you need a Savior? Because the wages of sin is death. All have sinned. 
And the very fact that all of us have sinned, that means all of us are under death sentence. You know, I've often wondered in my mind, just, just curiosity, what is it like for a man on death row who's sitting there knowing that the next day he's going to be, die, he's going to be killed? What goes through that man's mind? They say that man dies a thousand deaths sitting there waiting for the moment when the guards come to get him say it's time and they walk him into the death chamber and they strap him in to whatever means if it's going to be the gas chamber, the electric chair or now the lethal injection. They strap him down. What goes through that man's mind? Think about that and put yourself in that position. How the agony you must be going through. I don't care how many guys thought they were brave. They were agonizing. Tomorrow this time I'll be dead. Where will I be? They're, they're, they're struggling in their mind. What's happening? But then someone walks in or the, the warden walks in, unshackles you and say, you're free to go. Wait a minute, what happened? Uh, ain't they supposed to kill me tomorrow? No, somebody has already died in your place. You're free. You know, brothers, brothers and sisters, that's basically what it boils down to. That's basically what it boils down to. All of us are on death row. All of us, again, the ways of sin is death. All of us were on death row. But Jesus walked in and said, you don't have to die. You don't have to go to hell. When I was talking about dying, I'm not talking about physical death. I'm talking about the second death, going to hell. You don't have to go to hell. You don't have to be eternally separated from me. All oh, the horrors of hell, the, 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 the language, the pain, the suffering of hell forever. But you don't have to go. Because I've already paid the price. I've already died so you can be set free. Now the question is for you. Are you going to accept what Jesus did? Or are you going to keep on doing what you did? No, that's all right. I, I believe there's another way. No, there is no other way. Well, see, I believe that if I be good. No, that's not going to do it. Well, if I go to church every Sunday, that's not going to do it. Well, well if I pay my tithe and give the book, that's not going to do it. You must know Jesus. You must accept Jesus. He's the only way. He's the only hope. He's the only way to God. He's the only hope of salvation. Jesus, at the name of Jesus. So the wage of sin is death. I got a little bit of time here. Let me see if I can finish this up. All have sinned. So why do we need a Savior? Because all of us have sinned. All of us have sinned. And the very fact that all of us have sinned, all of us are disqualified from going to heaven. You know, we have categories of sin. We, well, Reverend, that was just a little white lie. I just told a little, I haven't done a whole, I just done a little, I just every now and then tip out and do this, that. It ain't hurt nobody. Well, but it's still sin. There is no little white lie. All lies are lies in the sight of God. There is no just tipping out, doing a little thing. I ain't hurting nobody. You're hurting yourself. All have sinned. So why do we need a savior? Because all of us have sinned. Now don't try to impress me. Because you're wasting your time impressing me. And tell me, Reverend, I haven't sinned in years. Reverend, I've been so long ago since I did it. It doesn't matter. You still did it. There's only one way it can be erased. What can wash away my sin? The songwriter said, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, how precious is thy flow. That makes me white as snow. No other found I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's salvation. In the blood of Jesus, the blood he shed, the blood he shed for me way back on Calvary, the blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. See, we've gotten away from them songs. We've gotten away from them songs. We, we nowadays, you know, our praise and worship just become hip hop, if you ask me, some of it, some of it, not, not all of it, but I was looking at things now and they doing, doing uh, praise and worship and it was, it was, um, Bells and whistles and, and smoke and, uh, and all that folk bopping and dancing. It was hip hop, you know. I, again, I'm old school. I'm old school. Just give me some good old songs that mean something. Even if you take the music away, they mean something. Some songs now, if you take the music away, you got nothing. But the lyrics will deliver you. All right, that's something else. I don't want to go on that. Uh, again, not only have all sinned, but why do we need a savior? Again, the first two, because the ways of sin is death. We need a savior because all of sin. But we need a savior because without him, there is eternal damnation. And there's no sense in sidestepping that, brothers and sisters. Ain't no sense in trying to ignore that. If you feel like you ignore it, it'll go away. Ain't no sense in letting these people lie to you and say there is no hell. Jesus preached about hell. And that story told about the rich man was not a parable. 
Because anytime Jesus told a parable, he would say the kingdom of heaven is likened unto, or he would give a, a, a simile statement to a metaphor of heaven. But this particular story, he said, there was a certain man, direct. There was a certain man, rich man. And there was a beggar. And he named the beggar Lazarus. And he said the rich man died. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes and was tormented in the flame. That's what Jesus said. Now, you're going to say there is no hell. You call me Jesus a liar. You call me Jesus a liar. It's impossible for Jesus to lie. So now, who's the liar? Jesus or the person that told you there's no hell? Jesus or the devil that told you there is no hell? Who's the liar? Who's the liar? Amen. And this is something I think we have to understand. We have to deal with these situations and look at them straight on. But thank God for Jesus. Ah, uh, let me see. Lauren's about to sing this out. Let me read my last scripture here. It says, at the name of Jesus, this is Philippians 2, 10 and 11. At the name of Jesus, every knee must bow and every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Brothers and sisters, there's salvation and no other. So when we're talking about this Christmas season. We're celebrating the birth of the Savior. Remember the purpose of the Savior. He came to save us. And it's in the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, that we can be saved. There is salvation and no other, other than the name of Jesus. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. I pray that you got this today. Once again, let us know where you're viewing from. Uh, also, I want to wish a Merry Christmas and a blessed New Year to every one of you. Praise the Lord. Remember, it's through Jesus. Jesus is the reason for the season. Y'all post that on my Facebook and somebody had a problem with it. That's your problem, sir, not mine. At the name of Jesus, we rejoice and glory in a God of our salvation. Until next week, this is Scott Bradley saying, God bless you. I love you. Merry Christmas to you. Have a blessed new year. We'll talk to you again real soon. God bless.